core and conditioning. We see these terms thrown around a lot in the combat sport world. We also see so many different ways of doing this, from taking punches or kicks to the midsection, or doing any variation of crazy exercise that claims to make your core stronger than ever. Well, and you learn how to be here. Okay. There, right? Yeah. And there. The first thing that we're gonna do in this video, just so that we're crystal clear, is define what we mean by core and conditioning. So let's start with the core. To be very truthful, the concept of the core is not very well understood. Some define it as the abdominal muscles like the rectus abdominis, the obliques, the transverse abdominis, etc. Which negates many of the other muscles that are involved with spinal movement. And others claim that it's any muscle that really attaches to or influences the movement of the spine. The problem with that definition is that you can make an argument for almost any muscle being a part of the core. Take the pecs for example, specifically pectoralis major. Pec major has an attachment on the sternum which could influence rib movement. And the ribs that articulate with the sternum wrap around posteriorly to articulate with the spine, which would necessitate the pec major's influence on the movement of the spine, however small it may be. There's also a random theory out there that says that 29 pairs of muscles make up the core, exactly 29. So what the hell is it? Since there's a lot of ambiguity, I very rarely use the term core. Instead, I use and will continue to use terms like trunk, trunk stability, and trunk control. This way we aren't always narrowing it down to specific muscles, but rather highlighting different muscles in different positions when it's necessary. However, I will say that most of the research that we're gonna look into later focus on the muscles in the front wrapping around to the back and the spinal muscles. I consider the trunk to be a broad region, extending from the neck to the glutes from top to bottom, and the width of your midsection from shoulder to shoulder. Again, this is broadly speaking since it's very hard to define concretely. And now that we're aware of what I mean when I say trunk, let's look at conditioning. Conditioning seems to have two meanings in this context. One is the idea of making the muscles stronger, or the structure of the body that take the strikes more durable. The second seems to be a desensitization of the peripheral nervous system to potentially help make the strikes less painful. Now let's look at what the science has to say and square that with some of the conventional wisdom that we continue to see in here today. And now as far as strengthening the muscles of the trunk is concerned, it seems that few things are better than the good old-fashioned compound movements like the squats, deadlifts, presses, lunges, etc. Now these big four certainly aren't the only movements. Unilateral movements like powerful rotational ball throws or pin lay rows can also be really good. The idea is that these compound movements do more than enough to make the muscles involved with trunk control stronger. This study even shows that movements like squatting have been shown to have more trunk muscle activity than a traditional weighted plank. Now there were some muscle groups that were more or less equivalent in activity, but squats had higher muscle activation in the erector spinae and the oblique groups as the exercise progressed in duration. Another recent systematic review with 67 studies included explored which exercises when performed resulted in the highest EMG activities. The groups of exercises that were explored were traditional core exercises, usually performed on the floor like sit-ups or back extensions, stability exercises, usually low load, low range of motion exercises like front planks and side planks, ball device exercises usually performed with unstable surfaces like a sit-up on a Swiss ball or a plank on the suspension system, and finally the free weight exercises like the squats, deadlifts, and shoulder presses. The overwhelming majority of the muscles they measured had higher activation with the free weight group than any other group. There were some muscles like the transversus abdominis and the internal oblique that saw some higher activation with more traditional exercises. However, if you're looking for the exercises that are most ecological and give you the most bang for your buck, free weight exercises seem to be the better option. Now you can certainly do some of the traditional exercises if you tolerate them better, or if you enjoy doing them, so there's nothing wrong with that. I just wouldn't remove free weight movements if you're already doing them. And if you're not already doing them, I'd suggest maybe adding in one or two and progressing that movement over time. And since I know a lot of you are scientifically inclined and like to read these studies, I'll address this while we're here. There's certainly some degree of error to account for with EMGs, and different ways of measuring EMGs can be tough to universalize. So I'm certainly not saying that these are perfect studies. What I am saying is that when we measure muscle activity in the way that we currently have to practically measure it, there's evidence to suggest that the free weight movements like squats, presses, deadlifts, etc. elicit higher muscle activities in many of the trunk muscles than traditional exercise. So again, if you aren't including these, maybe add one or two into your program. And if you're doing these already, you're already on the right track. Now we come to the idea of acclimating or desensitizing your body to certain striking movements. I talk about this a little bit in some of my previous videos on knuckle and shin conditioning, but the basic idea is this. Your peripheral nervous system has the ability to desensitize itself to certain stimulus. We physios take advantage of this when we design certain treatment techniques when nerves occasionally become hypersensitive. We introduce different textures to the skin at different pressures to allow the nervous system to adapt to non-harmful stimulus. But unfortunately, when it comes to shin and knuckle conditioning, area of the body involved is much smaller than the trunk. I'm kind of skeptical as to how efficient it would be to apply this to the large surface area of the body that is the trunk. This is where I think we see a majority of the silly stuff when it comes to the old traditional methods. It's almost certainly not the case that having your training partner or coach punch you in the face unprotected or kick you in the stomach unprotected is going to help you take strikes better. The uncomfortable truth about all this is that so much goes into taking a strike that it's almost impossible to mimic outside of a 
sparring environment. For one, if you're just taking punches over and over again that you're already expecting, you're really just contracting those muscles as hard as you can and waiting for somebody to hit you. A gigantic part of taking strikes is being able to realize when you're about to get hit and being able to move and contract whatever needs to be contracted to protect yourself. <laughs> None of this is being trained with the silly nonsense of having somebody punch you over and over again in the stomach. Learning how to take a punch or a kick is a behavior in itself. And it seems the best way to hone in and learn these behaviors is through actual sparring. Now this doesn't mean that it always has to be full speed. In fact, I would recommend against that. But even if you're lightly sparring and just moving around with a partner, you'll get the sensory benefit of feeling the strike and the psychological benefit of knowing that if you defend a strike properly, it won't necessarily be as harmful. And when we're talking about core conditioning, I think this is the conditioning jackpot. Gaining confidence in your ability to defend and developing good behaviors in a sparring environment. So let's bring it all together. Making your trunk stronger builds a really good foundation for you to effectively take strikes. You can do this by getting stronger in the larger compound movements and progressing them over time while sprinkling in some of those traditional exercises occasionally. Now, as you get stronger, you'll theoretically also be sparring enough to build confidence in your ability to defend. This seems like a great recipe to ensure that you have a nice stable trunk while performing your respective sport. What doesn't seem like a good idea is having your buddies punch you in the gut as hard as they can while you're hanging from a bar trying to flex your six pack. Although some girls may be into that, I don't know, it's a cool party trick. Anyway, let me know what you guys think in the comments. Thank you for watching, I'll see you next time.